What the heck is this thing on my skin? I get this question from my friends, family members, and patients every day. So today we're gonna to talk about some common things that I see on your skin and what they are. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis, and I'm a board certified dermatologist in Northern California, and I'm here to help you understand your skin and find products that work for you. If you enjoy this type of content, definitely give the video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Today, I'm gonna be going over things that are generally harmless on the skin, but can be distressing. And although I can't teach you how to be a dermatologist in 10 minutes, I can definitely give you an idea of what to look out for. Before we delve into the specific things that you may find on your skin, I wanna make it clear, this is not personal medical advice. If you have a growth or a rash on your skin that you are concerned about, you need to get an in-person consultation from a dermatologist. First up, let's go over things that show up on the skin as a skin-colored bump. One of the most common things I see and diagnose during a full body skin check is something called an intradermal nevus. And essentially this is just a skin colored mole. I think a lot of people, when they think about a mole, they assume that means it's going to be a brown growth on the skin, but many of them have no pigment at all. The term intradermal means that the cells that comprise that mole actually sit within the dermis. So below the skin surface, which is why they tend to be like a gentle dome on the skin rather than looking like they're sitting right on top of the skin. Now, occasionally these can be pigmented, or you may see a few little blood vessels rippling through if you look really closely, but a lot of times they're the exact same color as your skin. I feel like when you think of like the traditional witch's mole that sits on their nose, that's an intradermal nevus. These don't tend to be very large in size. They usually range from about three millimeters up to about a centimeter, and they are totally harmless. Now, most often these intradermal nevi develop after childhood. And so for a lot of people, they can be alarming because you can be in adulthood in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and develop a new bump on your face and be going, uh-oh, like, is this a skin cancer? but that is actually a totally normal time in your life to develop this type of growth. In general, we don't remove these because they are harmless, but occasionally one will be big enough or unsightly enough that someone wants it removed. And there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can excise it, meaning that we actually cut all the way around the mole and put stitches in, or you can do something called a shave removal where you shave it completely flat with the skin. Now, when you do something like a shave removal, you're actually not removing the entire mole. Remember, it's an intradermal nevus. So part of that mole tissue is actually sitting below the skin surface. And these types of moles also can grow hair, particularly as you get older. If you think of that like mole with that one wiry hair growing out of it, that is often an intradermal nevus. And I feel like there's a myth online and I see it go both ways, where if a mole is growing hair, that means it's cancerous. Or if a mole can grow hair, that means it's not cancerous. Whether or not your mole grows hair has nothing to do with its malignant potential. Now, another skin colored bump that sort of mimics the appearance of an intradermal nevus is something called sebaceous hyperplasia. This is a non-cancerous growth in which the oil glands that live below the skin surface begin to to enlarge and overgrow and they push up the overlying skin and it creates a little domed papule or a domed bump on the skin surface. Now, if you look really close at these, they actually look a little bit yellow and you sometimes see some blood vessels running through them. You will also see something called a central del or a central punctum, which is a little dot in the center of your sebaceous hyperplasia. Now, as a dermatologist, when I'm looking at someone's skin, I use a specialized tool called a dermatoscope that essentially magnifies and polarizes the light that I'm shining on a spot. So I I don't expect people to necessarily be able to tell the difference between an intradermal nevus or a sebaceous hyperplasia or a skin cancer without a tool like this and without training on how to use it. And I bring this up mostly because I have a lot of patients who I treat who have had skin cancers in the past, and then they'll develop something like sebaceous hyperplasia, which to the naked eye can look exactly like a basal cell skin cancer and they start freaking out about it. And so I always have to reassure them that because I have this tool and because I can see the skin so well with this tool, I can see some nuanced differences that maybe they can't appreciate. Now, now, whether or not you develop sebaceous hyperplasia is predominantly determined by your genetics, but things like immunosuppression and prolonged UV exposure can also make you develop them. The easiest way to address these is by performing a procedure in the clinic called electrocautery, where we essentially put a very hot electric needle onto the spot and it vaporizes that tissue. Now, as you can imagine, that procedure is a little bit uncomfortable, so I will generally numb my patients for something like this. Some dermatologists prefer to treat sebaceous hyperplasia by freezing it off or using a technique called cryotherapy, but I haven't found that in my hands at least to be as precise or as effective. I think the other thing worth noting is that if you have your sebaceous hyperplasia treated, they are likely to recur. And the reason for this is sebaceous hyperplasia 
originates deep in the skin and then pushes up over the skin surface. So when we are freezing it or burning it, we are essentially melting down that very top part of the sebaceous hyperplasia, but it still exists to some degree below the skin surface and can regrow. And I bring this up because I think a lot of people get frustrated by the fact that they might have to do some maintenance treatments if they're prone to developing these, but it's so much better to have to do maintenance every couple of years than to chase that sebaceous hyperplasia deep in the skin and leave the patient with a divided scar. Aside from doing things in the clinic to address sebaceous hyperplasia, using topical skincare that has a retinoid, so that's retinol or prescription tretinoin, for example, may help reduce sebaceous hyperplasia as well. Now I have to say, I have never seen sebaceous hyperplasia completely go away when someone's using prescription tretinoin, for example, but it certainly can reduce the size a little bit and prevent you from developing new ones. Now lastly, once in a while, I will have a patient who has truly disfiguring sebaceous hyperplasia. I'm talking about hundreds of spots over their face. And in that case, we actually use prescription Accutane to treat that. Some of you may be familiar with Accutane because it is a great treatment for cystic and scarring acne, but it also can be really helpful for sebaceous hyperplasia that's severe. Typically, if we're using it to treat sebaceous hyperplasia, we don't need the high doses that we use to treat acne. Oftentimes, someone will go on low dose, long-term Accutane for their sebaceous hyperplasia because as soon as they stop their Accutane, their sebaceous hyperplasia can return. So it's really rare that I prescribe Accutane in this way for a patient. But again, if someone has severe disfiguring sebaceous hyperplasia, it's an option. Aside from intradermal nevi and sebaceous hyperplasia, a third and common skin colored bump that I see on people's faces are something called syringomas. And those are little tiny bumps that often appear under the eyes, but can appear anywhere on the body. And I really wanted to bring these up because they usually are quite numerous under the eyes and they are often mistaken for milia, which I will also be talking about in this video, but they're not milia. They're actually little dilations of sweat wet ducts under the skin surface. I would say of all the different lumps and bumps that I'm gonna talk about today, syringomas are some of the most frustrating and most difficult to treat. The most common recommendation is to destroy them with electrocautery, similar to how we would treat sebaceous hyperplasia, or use some type of CO2 or resurfacing laser, but they never respond that well. I swear, every single cosmetic conference that I go to, someone in the audience will raise their hands and be like, have we found anything good for syringomas yet? And everyone's just like, no. So if I have a patient who has syringomas that they want removed, we will often do a couple of little test spots to see how they respond to cautery or to a laser. But then if they don't go away, my recommendation is to do nothing and just observe them. Eventually there probably will be something that helps with syringomas, but I don't think it's worth traumatizing that delicate tissue under the eyes, trying a bunch of things that are unlikely to work. Now moving away from syringomas, another thing that often shows up on the face are something called milia. Milia are tiny white keratin or dead skin cell protein filled cysts that can arise anywhere. They're most common around the eyes, but any area of friction on your face can develop them. And milia are so common that I have an entire YouTube video dedicated to explaining exactly what they are and exactly what you can do to treat them both in the office and at home. So if you have milia going on and you wanna know what to do about it, I'm gonna direct you to that video. All right, I'm gonna move on now to things that are found not just on the face, but we see more commonly on other parts of the body as well. Number one is something called dermatofibromas. These are firm, usually skin colored to brown bumps that often appear on the legs, but can happen anywhere on the body. The way they look on you will often depend on what your baseline skin tone is. In someone who has fair or light skin, they are often like a pink or dark pink bump. For people who have deeper skin tones, they are often brown and sometimes have this sort of whitish scar-like center. They can be a little bit indented, they can stick out a little bit, and the most common place you're going to see them is on the legs of women. In fact, they are so common that if my medical assistant comes out from seeing a patient and doing their intake and says, hey, I have a new patient here, she's worried about a bump on her leg, Almost always, it's a dermatofibroma. Now, we don't fully understand why people develop dermatofibromas. There definitely seems to be a genetic component to it, but we also think that they might develop at the site of some type of trauma to the skin. So we often see them where someone once had a bug bite or nicked themselves shaving or had an ingrown hair. So often when I have someone come in with a dermatofibroma, they wanna know if they can have it removed because sometimes they're a bit unsightly. But the only true way to remove a dermatofibroma is to cut it out from the skin and put stitches in. And oftentimes, almost every time, Time, the scar from removing the dermatofibroma is actually worse and more unsightly than the dermatofibroma itself. Now, if someone has a large dermatofibroma that's painful or itchy, we can do other things besides just remove it. Sometimes we'll inject a little steroid into it to help it flatten out and become less symptomatic. And sometimes freezing it will work as well. Now, DFs can look a little scary or even malignant on certain patients because they can often be quite pigmented. So if you have a dermatofibroma that has been diagnosed in the past, but you notice it changing or evolving, you should.
should definitely get it evaluated. Once a dermatofibroma forms, it should be stable in size, shape, and color. If it changes at all, it needs to be checked out. Another type of skin growth that I see all the time on skin and people often have questions about are something called cherry angiomas. These are small, smooth, bright red bumps that can appear anywhere on the body. These are something that are more likely to develop as you age. It's pretty rare to see these on someone in their teens or in their 20s, but definitely once you're 30 and above, all bets are off. Some people have just a few of them. Some people are covered in hundreds of cherry angiomas of differing sizes, and really that depends on your genetics. I think because they are so bright red, and if you were to like shave over one and nick it, it bleeds like crazy, they can make people kind of concerned, but they are generally never associated with any underlying medical issue. And sometimes people will confuse these cherry angiomas with another type of of angioma called a spider angioma, and they're slightly different. A cherry angioma is going to be smooth and really well demarcated, whereas a spider angioma is going to have a bright red center and sort of these radiating blood vessels out from it, like a spider. Spider angiomas are much more common in kids. We see them in adults as well, and those can be associated with underlying estrogen excess, whether that's because you are pregnant, you're on a birth control pill, or you have something going on like liver failure. I don't wanna freak you out by saying liver failure. If you had liver failure, that spider angioma developing on your skin would be a very late sign. You would know before then. When it comes to cherry angiomas, because they are so common, we don't treat them on a regular basis, but if someone is cosmetically bothered by them, they are super easy to treat with a laser. In my office, we have a V-beam laser, which is a laser that targets red blood vessels. You zap each cherry angioma, usually only one time. It turns purple for a few days and then it disappears forever. You can use things like cautery to heat up a cherry angioma and make it disappear that way, but I prefer to use a laser because it's more finessed. I don't think I could do this video as a dermatologist without talking about something called seborrheic keratoses because they're probably the skin growth I get the most questions about. And the reason for that is this type of growth is incredibly common. It is really rare that I see someone over the age of 50 years old who doesn't have one of these. And people are often a little concerned or worried about them because these are brown growths on the skin. And you kind of grow up being triggered to think about new brown growths as problematic. When you look at a seborrheic keratosis on the skin, it can be anywhere from skin colored all the way to black. And in terms of texture, it will often look a little bit warty or even like dried mud that's stuck on the skin. And you can really get these anywhere. Most often I see them develop on the hairline, between and under the breasts, and on the back. These are caused by genetics, age, sun exposure, and hormonal shifts in the body. There's really nothing you can do to prevent them, but once they start appearing on your body, they are definitely treatable. Now, similar to all the other growths I've talked about, we don't generally treat them because they are harmless, but if someone is bothered by them cosmetically, we can get rid of them. Or if they have a seborrheic keratosis that is particularly itchy or painful or catching on their clothes, we can remove it for that reason as well. Most commonly, we treat these with cryotherapy, so we freeze them off, but they can also be burned off or cut off. The other thing that makes seborrheic keratoses a little bit alarming is they can be really big. Like, I think the biggest seborrheic keratosis I've ever seen on a patient was like five or six centimeters, so like a big guy. And something I just wanna note about seborrheic keratoses because they come up so often and patients often are worried about them is they cannot turn into a skin cancer. Like, if it gets irritated or traumatized or only partially treated, it can't then evolve into something that's dangerous. One thing that sometimes mimics a seborrheic keratosis or gets confused with a seborrheic keratosis is a skin tag. And these are kind of exactly what they sound like. It's a little tag of skin that hangs off the neck, the armpits, or really any other skin site. I do wanna make a clarification point here. Sometimes I hear them called skin tabs. They are not skin tabs, they are skin tags, also known as acrocordons. Questions about skin tags come up a lot because they are so common. People wanna know what's causing them, how they can treat them at home, what they can do in the office. So I made an entire other YouTube video that's dedicated to that that you can check out. The final thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of like, what the heck is this on my skin are dilated pores or blackheads and something called epidermal inclusion cysts. Now, thank goodness for Dr. Pimple Popper, Dr. Sandra Lee. I feel like her channel really shined light on cysts and helped people understand what they are, but let's go over it. So number one, epidermal inclusion cysts are essentially a ball of dead skin cell protein that gets trapped under the skin surface in a little sack. When you have this on the skin, it might feel like just a firm bump, or you might see a bump arise over the skin surface. And there's always going to be a central punctum or a central pore where this cyst originated from. Now, there are some things you should understand when it comes to cysts like this. One, they're not dangerous. They can't transform 
transform into a cancer. However, if you have a cyst that's changing or evolving, it's still good to get it checked out because it might be infected or inflamed. The other thing that's really important to understand about cysts is they have this sac around them. So a lot of times people will come in and be like, hey, can you just like put a little cut in my skin and drain the cyst? But the problem with that is if you don't go in and remove the sac that's underneath the skin surface, that cyst will almost always come back. So when we're talking about treating cysts definitively, we have to cut the entire cyst out. And that's generally a pretty easy surgery. And unfortunately, not everyone's insurance covers it, but it is something that you can have done. Now, in contrast to a cyst, you may have seen something on the skin that looks like just a big blackhead. That is called a dilated pore of Weiner. And I feel like these go viral on TikTok all the time, watching them get extracted because, wow, that is so satisfying. But if you just extract a dilated pore, it will always come back. The only way to definitively treat it is cut it out and put stitches in to close the skin back up. So even though it just looks like a massive blackhead, it's slightly different because the skin would not heal over if you just remove that. Now a note about cysts. All firm lumps and bumps that exist under the skin are not cysts. You can have inflamed lymph nodes. Those can be signs of cancer. And I don't say that to alarm you, but if you have a cyst where we can't appreciate a punctum or a central opening, and it's not freely movable in the tissue, meaning it feels like bound down to underlying structures, that is definitely worth getting an evaluation so that we can tell if it's a cyst or something else. Everything I've spoken about up until this point has been non-cancerous, also known as benign, but of course you can also grow skin cancers on your skin. Like I said in the beginning of this video, I can't teach you to be a dermatologist, but one hallmark sign of skin cancer is something called the ugly duckling sign. If you have a spot that matches no other spots on your body. It's changing in a way that your other spots are not changing. It's a color that none of your other spots are, or it has symptoms that none of your other spots have, get it evaluated. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a skin cancer, but it's worth getting it checked out by a professional. Now, if you have additional questions on how to identify skin cancer and different types of skin cancer, I have a YouTube video that goes through every single part of that. All right, so now that you've watched this video, I hope you know a little bit more about what the heck is on your skin. I hope you found it helpful. If you have other types of spots or questions about them, definitely let me know in the comments. Also, if you have any of these spots on your skin, are you doing anything about it? Are you just watching it? Let us all know. Thank you so much for being here. Don't don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.